Today we are here to talk about co-occurring, overcoming the challenges of navigating dual diagnosis as a peer. And we're going to have Kyle Palmer, who is a certified peer support specialist and a targeted case manager, um, present on this. Um, Kyle is a certified peer support specialist with over six and a half years of sobriety from alcohol and other substances. In May 2019, he shared the nature of his alcoholism for the first time with another person struggling with alcoholism, which led to lasting sobriety for both of them. Shortly after, Kyle started blogging about his 30 plus years of struggles as a Mormon alcoholic and found his passion for peer support. In November 2019, Kyle took on a recovery support position with the Davis Behavioral Health and was part of the team that opened up the Innovative Davis Receiving Center. The center offers treatment instead of jail for individuals dealing with substance use and mental health issues. It integrates peer support into traditional clinical treatment to improve outcomes. Two years later, Kyle transitioned into the Outpatient Recovery Support Services team, where he provides outpatient peer services, case management, and community outreach for intensive outpatient clients. In early 2023, he joined the Dual Diagnosis Program, supporting those with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. Outside of work, Kyle facilitates 12-step meetings and participates in community recovery events and founded Change of Heart, like a music ministry bringing hope and healing to families impacted by addiction and mental illness. Kyle's lived experience with addiction and mental health and his passion for peer support make him a powerful voice in the recovery community. Let's give a hand for Kyle, y'all. I heard I'm going to have to speak up because this is more for the people online than for you guys. Um, if, if, you, if I, I have a tendency to kind of do this sometimes. So if you can't hear me in the back, just say, speak up. Uh, I'm Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Oh, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Hi. Hello. Yeah, we're going to go. We're going to go. Hi, I'm Kyle. <laughs> let's start. Actually, let's start with a little bit of fun. Uh, I, get, I get criticism for not being a fun guy. I talk about serious things in my groups all the time. Like, we haven't had any fun. Unfortunately, <laughs> let's have a little fun. Um, perfect. So, scrolling through our memes about depression, anxiety, and alcoholism. Put on your good Ross voice. Ah, uh, you Huh? How about this one? Anybody relate with this? Have you ever seen a cult without texting first? Yeah. Is there a way to get that bar off the top so we can see the full slide? How about this one? Life's like a helicopter. I don't know how to operate a helicopter. That's a good one. I like that. This one, the charges are correct, sir. The airline tra now charges for emotional baggage as well. Wow. Oh, wow. And my favorite, I think I've worked with this doctor before. A life doctor once wrote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so here we are talking about dual diagnosis. Um, I'd like to start by sharing a story. Um, This is me with my son Dustin 16 years ago, three years old at the time. Uh, Dustin was born with uh, high spectrum autism. What? With high spectrum autism. And, uh, you know, for most of my life I've worried, you know, autism never goes away. I, I, and I found that really intimidating when I was young, younger, and he was younger. Um, he had a lot of problems with overstimulus and understimulus when it came to sensory perception. And one day, we had a tornado come through the neighborhood. And my, south, and my southeast Denver, or southwest, excuse me, Denver neighborhood. And as, as the kids went downstairs, 
to um, shelter from the storm. Um, the rain and the hail the size of golf balls came down, busted the windows out, the wind's blowing through the room where they're sheltering, and he was just totally freaked out. Uh, this translated to him being scared of the wind for what I thought was going to be the rest of his life. You know, for years, I couldn't roll the window down a little bit in the car if it was hot because the wind blew. And it was, it was really sad, really frustrating. Um, Gradually, uh, Dustin finally uh, started learning that the wind wasn't dangerous usually, and that he could control his anxiety a little bit. And so, here he is now. You know, he still has those little six-year-old behaviors that he'll always have, and it's little and life, he's 19 years old, and he's this tall, and he can beat me in a wrestling match any day of the week. But I am beginning to learn that in spite of that, Dustin is finding his way to recover. Um, I love this quote, I'm not afraid of the storms, for I am learning to sail my ship. Dustin is learning to sail the ship of autism. He's doing very well, he's making me proud. He, he, all by himself, we, we had him set up to get into the ATC. A week before school starts, he came home. I enrolled in Weber State. I'm going go to I'm gonna go to school at Weber instead. <laughs> and it was a good learning experience for him. He decided after a quarter at Weber that he was probably better off at the ATC. But he's learning. So, who is Kyle Palmer and why am I here talking with you today? Um, there are many labels that I've worn at some point in my life. Husband, father, grandfather, uncle, son, pro musician, skier, bus driver, choir director, motion graphics artist, swimmer, horseback riding instructor, garbage truck driver, um, social worker, motorcycle enthusiast, pianist. But there is one more label that I've lived with all my life. And that label honestly has influenced how I wear all those other labels. And I kind of got tipped in my bio there. I am a Mormon alcoholic. That's the label I put on myself. And perhaps I should uh, say more appropriately that I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints for six and a half years into long-term recovery from alcohol use disorder. That's such a wonderful. <laughs> and you'll have to forgive me about the person first language sometimes. And, and there's two or three stories that I share tonight that are easier with using the old kind of offending terms. Apologies if those come out of the name of Um so a little bit, bit about me, as we mentioned before, uh, I am a recovery support specialist who lives in Hill Health. I'm um, currently working with the uh, dual diagnosis program in, in uh, Davis County. And I helped open the receiving center. Um, I am a lifetime member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I facilitate 12-step meetings for them on my off time. Um, and I, I participate in the church. And I'm also the founder of Jeff which is a music ministry to benefit the families and the individuals who struggle with alcoholism and other addictive behaviors. So, in August this year, my wife and I are going to celebrate four years of marriage. Um, yay, yeah, please. <laughs> um, I was a closet drunk. Julie was undiagnosed bipolar for the first 10 years of our marriage. Um, it, it was to say the least, complicated. Um, ten years later, Julie got her diagnosis and started getting treatment for her problems. I did not. I spent another two decades uh, just spiraling deeper and deeper into alcoholism. Um, ours is a fairy tale romance. Can I tell you the fairy tale? Once upon a time, a handsome prince with anxiety, substance use disorder, attention deficit disorder, 
situational depression and hypersexual body issues. Met beautiful princess with bipolar depression, body image distortions, severe postpartum psychosis, and oppositional defiance disorder. Oh, and multiple disorders. They fell madly in love, quickly becoming codependent. After the princess waited for the prince to return from his LDS mission, they married in the Ogden Temple. Turn the page to learn that the prince's first alcoholic binge was eight days before the wedding. <laughs> uh, triggered by what? Obsessive insecurity and the pressures of planning the wedding. Um, now, as king and queen, they had four beautiful princesses and a young prince who collectively struggled with clinical depression, panic and anxiety, panic and social anxiety, borderline personality, high spectrum autism, cutting, mutilation, self-harm, occasional excessive substance use, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicidal ideation, and in one case, an attempted suicide. And they all lived happily ever after. Well, how does that happen? How does, how does happily ever after live, happen? And my family is not unique. The more I work with families, the more I realize that every family has issues. Looking at the statistics that we heard late, earlier today, most families, whether they're going to admit it or not, deal with addictive behaviors of some sort. So ultimately, my passion for dual diagnosis peer support comes from knowing that happily ever after, though difficult, is possible. For me, for my family, and for my clients, and for everybody in this room. Um, that's not where it started, however. My passion, my current passion for dual diagnosis started when I had absolutely no passion for dual diagnosis. Uh, as I mentioned, I started at the Davis Receiving Center, and I was certainly not equipped to sell my children. And if you remember that first quote, what happens when we, when we learn to sail our ship? We aren't afraid. I was very afraid. Um, I lived in Caribbean now. Now, I went in with these great expectations. I had just found recovery. I'm living on the pink cloud. I am going to save the world one addict at a time. And all I'm going to do is share my story with them, and they're going to go, oh, I see the light. I'm going to stop using it. I'm going to stop having mental health issues. I'm, uh... <laughs> is that reality, by the way? No. Um, I believed in total abstinence, not harm reduction, not any of the stuff that we're talking about, not, not even one day at a time. Looking at the uh, you know, looking at the the positive changes that my clients make, I was preaching stop, stop using, don't act like that. Boy, was I not. What was the reality? I had no lived experience with street drugs. I had no lived experience with the justice system. I had no lived experience of psychosis or paranoia. Um, within the first three months of the receiving center, and I was on the graveyard shift, so I was me, another peer support who also had about three months worth of experience, and a brand new nurse that had about six months of experience nursing and then in an addiction recovery program. Um, so, and the receiving center is a, an opportunity for clients to be brought to treatment instead of to jail. And so the cops that bring people in, drop them off to us, and they're all ours. So one night I've, I've got a guy that I had never been around somebody having paranoid delusions and psychosis. He believed. <laughs> in his heart of hearts that there was a gang just outside the window that was set on killing him. And he was hiding below the window, peeking out, and coming back over and yelling at us that they're going to get me, they're going to get me, what are you going to do? About 10 minutes into it, he decided that I was one of the gang members and that I needed to be killed. Um, 
client, a good friend of mine now, uh, in, his, in his paranoia, he decided that uh, he didn't like me. And he came running clear across the facility, dove across the desk, and took a swing at me. Um, I lost my first client to suicide. I lost several other clients in the first three months to accidental death related to their substance use. Um, I had one client, another one that I'm really familiar with now, hesitate to call him a friend, but he is, um, who, again, delusional, he was going to kidnap his kids, which were not his birth kids, they were his girlfriend's kids, and take them to Colorado and hide out with them so that DCFS would find them. And we spent an entire shift just working through this. Um, Plus all the stresses, I started at the receiving center in December of 2019. Guess what happened in February of 2020? I'm dealing with what everybody else is doing. I'm dealing with the lockdown and all the stress about I'm going to die if I get exposed to this and getting exposed to it every day at work as essential personnel. So that's my background. That's where I started. I was scared to death of psychosis. Um, delusional thinking, um, paranoia, uh, all the things that we see every day in this business. Um, so, what are we going to talk about today? Um, I will give you a kind of ground level view of what the dual diagnosis is, the barriers that dual diagnosis presents in treatment. Uh, and the links between substance use disorder and mental illness. Uh, we also explore the ch adverse childhood experiences as a significant cause of dual diagnoses. And finally, I will give you five keys to how to deal with this stuff. Um, so, just by show of hands, how many uh, certified peers do I have? <laughs> Almost all of you. Um, how many of you are primarily substance use peers? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, almost half of us. Mental health peers? Family peers? Any friends of peers? No friends that's in here today, darn it. Um, much of what I'm going to talk about today is becoming comfortable with the Um In my experience, in, in uh, Van Poem, several of my coworkers any of which are in the room right now, about, <laughs> about their experiences and what they're comfortable doing, what they're not comfortable doing, and almost without exception, uh, mental health peers are uncomfortable working with people that are actively using substances. And people like me, who are primarily substance use, you already heard my story, but I was scared to death. Um, Ed Grill and Poe uh, spoke of what it's like to struggle with both addiction and mental illness. I have no pleasure in the stimulants which I sometimes so madly indulge. It has not been in the pursuit of pleasure that I have periled life and reputation and reason. It has been from the desperate attempt to escape from torturing memories, from a sense of insupportable loneliness, and a dread of some strange impending doom. So, what is dual diagnosis? According to SAMHSA, people with substance use disorders are at particular risk for developing one or more primary conditions or chronic diseases. The coexistence of both mental health and substance use disorder is known as a co-occurring disorder and is, a common, um, is common among people in treatment. Uh, dual diagnoses are not unusual, and we've seen the statistics earlier today, 50% or more of people who are in treatment for mental health have the substance use history and vice versa. And most studies think those numbers are low due to the reporting. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And somebody brought that up in one of the sessions today. And yeah, there are so many. I mean, what percentage of people actually tell the truth? When, when I was actively using, I'd go to the doctor and say, Oh, no. Do you drink alcohol? Oh, no, never. <laughs> Or if I if I got red and said yeah a little bit how much oh just a drink or two. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I would think that I would, uh, the other thing is um, how many people really realize that their mental illness is what is driving their substance abuse disorder. Because right. I was mentally unstable, uh, very suicidal, 
and, and the drug to my addiction because of trauma. Once I was able to address my mental illness, my substance abuse, um, kind of went away. Like I'm, I'm not as codependent on my substances. Once my mental, abuse, my mental um, trauma and everything was being able to be aware of it and address my uh, BPD and all the other um, that I have, the substance abuse kind of took it back to see through my mental illness. And for the online people, let me just kind of paraphrase the highlights there. Um, he was commenting that his mental health problems contributed to the substance use. And that, it, that it's challenging the treatment. We'll talk about that more a little bit. How long did you have? The most, most uh, credible researchers place that number closer to 80 to 90 percent. Okay. And he says that most credible researchers claim 80 to 90 percent that have co occurring disorders. Um, so you also heard the term comorbidity. Uh, anybody know the difference between co occurring and comorbid? Comorbidity, um, uh, both of those terms are basically interchangeable, but frequently we hear about comorbidity if there are two or more mental health diagnoses, as in post-traumatic stress and borderline personality. Um, comorbidity can also refer to a medical condition and substance use or mental health, uh, such as your chronic pain and substance use disorder. Uh, the statistic at the bottom of the paragraph there, 52 to 74 percent of people with substance use also experience chronic pain. That's also a huge part of my story. I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia 25 years ago, and I was using alcohol to cope with my chronic pain long before I had that diagnosis. So, why is it hard to treat people with dual diagnosis? I mean, it's hard enough, right, to to treat somebody who has substance abuse issues. On um, the mental health side, it's hard enough to treat a mental health issue. Um, why do the two together make it worse? According to the National Library of Medicine, um, because each dual diet or disorder can aggravate the course of the other, both disorders must be treated if the patient is to have the best chance of good That sounds great. That's it. I mean, that's a perfect world thing. You know, everybody gets treatment for all of their diagnoses at the same time. Does that happen? No. No, not at all. Um, why traditional treatment prescribes getting sober before working on side issues? Um, how many of you have seen that treatment? Yeah. We want you to be certain. We want you to be however many days sober before we can start talking about. I work at a dual diagnosis treatment unit, mm -hmm. and we can't start with someone who is actively high, you have to send them to be away to detox. Yeah, yeah he's commenting that, that um, where he works, they work with dual the diagnosis, and it's true. We need to do a social detox first, yeah. or a medical detox, depending on the substance. Um, and at Davis Behavioral, um, we have the same thing. We have the receiving center, which is a t detox, which feeds right into our system of dual diagnosis or can feed into the mental health treatment of the crisis recovery unit. Um, so we have a little issue with the chicken or the egg, which came first. Is the mental, is the psychosis causing people to use? As in, you know, I drink to, to uh, avoid hearing my voices or to cope with my voices. Or, did somebody that used meth get drug induced psychosis? It's hard to tell. Um, did the plant drink to cope with their depression or did the alcohol cause her to be depressed? These are tough, these are tough things, and, and without time, without sober time and treatment, it's almost impossible to diagnose. Um, chance of relapse. And relapsing on, from a mental health standpoint, of course, makes our substance use worse. Relapsing, you know, a plant goes out and uses meth, what happens? The voices are back. The psychosis is back. Um, and then medical interactions. If we're talking about medical conditions, um, there are interactions between psych meds and, and medical prescriptions that make it even more of a challenge. And then the separate systems. Um, Poland, do you guys have like a place where you send people to detox, or do you have to send them to another? We usually use a POA. Okay, so it's not in-house, but it's in, in your uh, 
we in our referral network. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And then severity, um, by its nature, no diagnosis is harder to treat. Um, both of, both diseases feed on each other. Oh, okay. Um, when we make a lifestyle of openly confronting painful feelings, we resolve the trauma. There will be a lower, there will be a lowering of the overall stress in the body. Confrontation forces everything in other events. Um, let's talk about PTSD for a minute. And we've, uh, we've heard quite a bit about this in the conference. And uh, I probably want to hurry through because I want to get to the second half of my thing. Um, what is PTSD? PTSD is a mental health condition that can develop when people experience or witness traumatic events. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of talk today about what those traumatic events are, what they look like. Um, I feel like a little imposter syndrome here because there's been somebody in every session that I've gone to that can explain my slides better than I can explain them. So hopefully you guys have been listening. I'm kind of going to flash through here. Um, symptoms of PTSD, there's a lot of them. Um, and, and I think most of us are familiar with this. Um, while it's natural to feel afraid during and after a traumatic event, most people recover from the initial symptoms. People who can't recover are the ones that we consider to have PTSD. Now, what's the link between substance use and PTSD? Um, comorbid PTSD and substance use disorder is associated with more costly clinical course when compared with either disorder or not. Um, so, more chronic health issues, poor social functioning, higher rates of suicide, more legal problems, increased risk of violence, uh, worse treatment adherence, and less improvement during treatment. That last one's tough. We don't see it progressing, we go, okay, they're, they're, they're a lost cause, right? You ever thought that? I kind of had that, that myself. Um, so, in short, two disorders complicate each other. Um, statistical level, in the general population, 7.8% um, will have diagnosable PTSD sometime in their life. And 23% will struggle with substance use. In the population that gets treatment for PTSD, nearly half also meet the criteria for substance use disorder. Um, among patients who seek treatment for PTSD, clients are up to 14 times more likely than the patients without PTSD to have a substance use disorder. That's scary. Conversely, those who seek treatment for uh, substance use will have anywhere from one third, one third to two thirds higher likelihood of having PTSD sometime within their life. And if you are under the influence when you experience trauma, you are four, it says twice there, I was going to say four times more likely to develop PTSD. Um, so let's make it personal. How many of you have experienced trauma in the lifestyle that involves everybody raise their hand for those people at home? Um, so PTSD is a big deal for us, right? Okay, I love this quote. All happy families resemble one another. Every unhappy family is unhappy in their own fashion. Um, this is Leo Tolstoy from Anna Karina. Um, Everybody has a story. Every family has a story. Um, and as we heard, as we heard, uh, at least two of the sessions that I heard today, you know, we've heard a lot about ACEs. ACEs is adverse childhood experiences. Adverse childhood experiences contribute greatly to um, the likelihood of somebody having ongoing mental, physical, and emotional problems. Um, things like physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, uh, neglect, um, household, you know, did, did, your, did your father beat your mother? Did, was one of your parents incarcerated? Was there a uh, substance use problem with your parents or a responsible adult that you have? Um, divorce contributes as well. Um, so how does, how does this translate into adult life? Um, 
ACEs increase the adolescent risk factors and follow individuals into adulthood, impacting overall health, well-being, education, and job potential. Additional risk factors for adults have increased the prevalence of injury, sexually transmitted infections, material, and child health problems, sex trafficking, and chronic diseases such as cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and suicide. Um, and ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of the population has at least one ace. And one in eight has four aces. Um, there is a close relationship between how many adverse childhood experiences you had and the severity of the problems in adult life. Um, the higher race score is, the worse your health outcomes are going to be. And so here's the statistics. Um, the people who reported only one ace um, they were 60% more likely to be diagnosed with a mental health condition than those who had no ACEs. You remember, about two-thirds of us had at least one. So adults with an ACE score of four or more are more likely to, in, to experience a number of health issues, including 2.4 times more likely to have hepatitis, 3.9 times more likely to have emphysema or lung disease. Four times more likely to have depression. Ten times more likely to be an IV drug user. Twelve times more likely to attempt suicide. If you have four aces or more, you are twelve times as likely to attempt suicide. And seven times more likely to be an alcoholic. And you have 3.5 times the risk of ischemic heart disease, which is the number one killer in the United States from here by now, I don't have time today to go into all the whys and wherefores and how that happens. I just wanted to make you aware of it. Um, but how can we fix it? Uh, although ACEs have a lasting impact, there's this thing called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability of our brain to heal from trauma. And neuroplasticity is real. Um, one way to prevent ongoing implications of ACEs is to build resilience. We hear a lot of talk about resilience. Um, I've been to entire conferences that that's what it was, the conference on resilience. Um, increasing resilience is often low cost and has a lasting impact. So what can we do? Um, reminder on this, we're talking about children, and if you have children in your chair, these are things you can do with them for now, but guess what? If I start using alcohol at 14 years old and I'm a daily drinker for, say, 25 years when I'm 40, I am going to be accused of being like a reckless teenager. And that is because our emotional development ends at the age where we started using it. And so a lot of our clients, you know, they may be in a 40-year-old body, but emotionally they can still be a kid. And so these things work with our clients just as well as they do with little kids. First of all, and a lot of this is going to sound familiar from your uh, peer training, by the way. Um, fostering a safe, stable, and supportive relationship with the parent, caregiver, or other trusted adult, which is us, right? Uh, supporting the child or adult client in making friends and building supportive social networks. Are we working with our clients to find friends? that are sober, that are supportive, that understand. Uh, practicing for future adversity through problem-solving based play, in other words, role play. How are we going to do these things? Uh, name your emotion, practice coping skills, deep breathing. Um, normalizing and asking for help. And not rushing to solve the problems. We'll be talking about that more later. And modeling resiliency and coping skills, including damage, uh, repairing damaged relationships and being accountable for mistakes, and complimenting them on their strengths. Um, Donald talked about that, how the, uh, what was it, the, the um, I forget which, which definition it was, but it was reward every positive step. So, here's the five keys. Although the world is full of suffering, it is also so full of overcoming the best on killer. Um, first key we're going to talk about is educate yourself. I was completely uneducated when, we started, when I started in this industry. 
um, and Dred Vester blemish nails. Uh, I feel uncomfortable because I'm insecure about who I am. That is a huge thing with mental health, it's a huge thing with addiction recovery. I don't know who I am without the substance in my case, you know. What, what are my coping skills? It's a long list. Drink alcohol. That's all I learned for 30 years. It's the only way I cope. Um, so, get curious, and I brought this up a little bit earlier. Um, if you are one of those people who go, yeah, I'm not very comfortable working with somebody that has a substance use issue, be curious, be brave. Find opportunities to talk to people that have substance abuse issues. And that's what I'm forward to soon. Um, if your life experience is mental health, I did that one already. If, you're, if, if your primary is substance use, learn about mental health. Um, okay. Um, so that some resources, and I'm just gonna blast through these because I have way too many slides. <laughs> but one one favorite that I found. Welcome to the Dual Diagnosis Hub. Uh, this is dualdiagnosis.org.uk. Uh, it's I mean I could spend days if not weeks in this website. They have videos and articles about recovering from dual diagnosis, about what different diagnoses actually are and what they look like in real life. It's plain English, they have some great, great informational videos. Um, they have resources for worldwide meetings of 12 step, including um, dual diagnosis and others. <laughs> Uh, Self-help, self uh, self-assessment quizzes, lots of those. You and your client can go through these, figure out what your problems are. Do you have this problem if you're struggling with somebody that you know has a substance use issue and they're, and they're pre contemplated? Maybe yeah. that's a good tool. Um, lots of free training courses and a ton of other stuff. Okay, more resources. Uh, SAMHSA has some wonderful stuff. NAMI, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health, is wonderful. Um, locally, um, the Department of Substance, Substance and Mental Health is here today. Um, and if you have the opportunity, this was this just popped up with me this week. Take the course on mental health first aid. It was amazing. I did, I did the training on Monday and I learned so much. Um, if your agency has the opportunity to invite them in, uh, Optum was the one that administered it for us and it was amazing. It's an eight-hour course on how to approach people with problems that we are uncomfortable approaching. Okay, second key, don't be afraid. Um, if someone's broken, don't try to fix them. You can't. If someone is hurting, don't attempt to take away their pain. You can't. Instead, love them by walking beside them in the hurt. You can't. Because sometimes what people need is to simply know that they're not. Got a video here, and I'm not sure if it's going to play or not. Oh, I don't. Let's go here first. Me and my daughter, Kate. Okay. Step way too far ahead. Okay, Katie, and here we go with not person first language. Katie is, that's my nickname for her, she loves that she's my border poor girl. <laughs> she has borderline personality. She has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. She has a diagnosis of um, she had she had a stroke when she was 25. She has rheumatoid early onset of rheumatoid arthritis. She is almost crippled at 26. Um, and she's a prime example of ACEs because she was raised at a time when my wife was going through the worst of hers and I was going through the worst of mine. Um, 
She, of course, as bipolar people do, married her narcissist. And she still <laughs> She's still being gaslighted every day and, and struggling with all the stuff that comes with that. Um, in 2019, they had a big blow up. It's Christmas. Um, I was determined I was going to go out there. I was going to knock some heads. I was going to drag. She's in Colorado. I was going to drag her and my grandson back to save them. Fortunately, I <coughs> the first had another idea. And I couldn't go on my life to do this. She went out there, she gave Katie some love, she helped her find some resources for treatment, and she came home, leaving Katie in that dangerous situation that I was so upset about. Um, and in hindsight, my efforts to save Katie would have removed her from a tragedy. Uh, this is Katie's best friend, Sarah. Sarah died in a mass shooting in Denver. Um, when was it? Christmas of, I want say, 2021. Working at the counter where Katie would have been working if they hadn't traded shifts. Talk about trauma. Um, and I was, I was worried that that was going to destroy her. Despite how tragic her situation was, uh, this, this event was pivotal in Katie's recovery. Um, several events that I don't have time to share happened to make it possible for her to go to art school that she always wanted to do. And now she shares her story of recovery from grief, borderline personality disorder, PTSD, bipolar depression, uh, being a stroke survivor at 25 and early onset rheumatoid arthritis with the world through her art. Um, Katie has made remarkable progress. She is becoming skillful at sailing her ship. <laughs> And, um, she still struggles. She still lives with her narcissist. She still has all those symptoms that come with bipolar, that come with blood um, She is not afraid to live life in recovery. Um, okay, what is empathetic listening? Empathetic listening is paying attention and not caring, right? Um, a structured technique that involves attentive and responsive listening during a conversation. I'm not sure how to launch this video. Can you give me the clip there? It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And... I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to see things right. Okay. So those empathetic listener, don't be a fixer. <laughs> Listen. We know how we know how to do this. We've been trained about how to do this. Right? <laughs> I'll just put those up quick, take a shot of it if you want to. And then, loving what is, what is real. Um, there's, there's a, a duplicate quote. 
<laughs> okay, so who's heard of radical acceptance? Radical acceptance is defined as the ability to accept situations that are outside of your control without judging. Radical acceptance has changed my relationship and my life with my wife. I am no longer the food police. She has an eating disorder that she's kind of from one of these days. Um, my stress and my anxiety went down so much when I stopped worrying about what she's eating and started just enjoying meals with her again. Um, remember when we're talking about psychosis, paranoid, delusional thinking, to them it's real. Their brain is giving them the stimulus that they're seeing the things that they see. That they're hearing the things that they hear. To them, it is as real as me looking at you, me being able to reach out and touch you. And if we acknowledge that, it makes our communications with them so much easier. Um, so, how do we do that? It's the same thing that we do with trauma treatment. I hear you, I see you, I believe you, I stand with you. Okay? Um, when I first started working in dual diagnosis a little over a year ago, um, I was just scared to death to ask my clients about what they see, what they hear. Um, those of you who are used to dealing with mental health, you're probably scared to death to ask, you know, about people's substance use. Don't be scared. Almost without exception, I have experienced, as long as I don't go, so, that's what your voice is like. Yeah, yeah. Is not so, have, you ever, have you ever done that? Love is not judgmental. And yeah. Actually will respond yeah, if you're being, and Owen says, if you're not being judgmental, they will talk to you, they will describe what's going on with them. Um, I have learned so much from my clients. Okay, the big part that I want to get to here is to stop the stigma. Glenn Close said, what mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversation. So, you probably recognize that guy in the picture with me from the last two days. There are three really significant dates for my recovery that I share as part of my recovery story. The first one is... June 6, 1981, my first rep. January 22nd, 2018, my last rep. And May 4th, 2021, the day that I met Brian. When I went into peer training, I, I got the job, COVID happened. They did not for the training for over a year. I worked at the Pacific Center for a year and a half without having a certification. Yeah. Therefore, a lot of my scary stuff that I talked about earlier. You know, I was just frightened to death every day to go to work. So I go to peer training. We all have our masks on. It's like the first time we've all been in a room this size with this many people since, you know, a year ago. And I'm kind of nervous about this. I get there and there's a guy sitting at one of the desks and he has the nervous tics and, and that's the first speech. And, I'm going, oh, okay, I'm going to be sick by him all day. Then he gets up, stands in front of the room, and goes, hi, I'm your instructor. <laughs> now, in his credentials, he was uh, the, over the USU Department of Career Certification. I expected to see a college professor. He showed up in a white shirt and a tie, and it was like, this. He was so he was so uncomfortable. I think that's the only time I've ever seen Brian in one shirt. <laughs> and by the time he stood up, it was already unbuttoned and the tie was loose. And by his, you know, he, he did the 20 minute intro and his co facilitator took over. The shirt came off. He was laying on the floor with his feet up on the, on the chair. <laughs> because he was having one of those days. And I thought, oh, gosh. This is not what I signed up for. <laughs> and over that week, as I watched Brian, my life changed. I, honestly, my life changed. I love Brian today. Uh, because he showed me what recovery looks like for schizophrenia. Um, so stigma, what is stigma? Um, Stigma is a set of negative attitudes, stereotypes, and beliefs that can affect people with mental illnesses and substance use disorders. 
it can also impact their health and well-being and them getting help. Stigma can manifest in many ways. Stereotyping, discrimination, internalization, systemic stigma. Um, I have a lot of stigma about schizophrenia. That came out when I saw Brian. Being around him for a week, being forced to be in this room, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so uncomfortable. Guess what, right about day three, I was just in love with people in recovery from mental illness. And there was a point in that training where we're talking about the clinical definition of fear. What is fear? How does it affect us? And Brian said, fill in the blank. If I weren't afraid, I would blank. And I'm like, oh my gosh. If I was not afraid, what would I do? What would I do in my job? What would I do in my personal life? Um, how would this look like in my life? And I had to rethink everything. And that happens when I come to these, these uh, seminars as well. I've had like three moments today where I'm completely reconsidering what I'm teaching you guys because I learned a better way to teach you. Um, but having finally met someone with a severe mental health diagnosis and learning to understand what changed my life. Um, I'm going to skip this section. Just in short, um, you know, there are stigmas against mental health peers by our management, our upper management. Um, I don't have time to share the story, but um, peer support roles may extend to the following down here at the bottom, providing services and training, supervising other peers. Um, by the way, there has been a change in, in the policy where peers can supervise peers with the right training. No, I want to share a story on that point. Okay. When, when I did my uh, my training two years ago at the hospital, I was the only one in that training who qualified for my peer support certificate, primarily based on mental health. I was in a room with substance use primary, mm -hmm. and it felt like, what the hell are you doing? And, and yeah, that was, it was about the same demographic in, in our course. There was like one, one mental health care and all the rest was with substance use. Um, okay, I'm gonna jump to and we saw this we saw this uh, definition earlier today as a person in long term recovery from substance use. Oh, excuse me, this was my what my what I like to add to because I'm a 12 step guy. I'm a substance use guy. I hadn't acknowledged that my social anxiety and all these other things that I had not been diagnosed with uh, were factoring into it. So first drink, last drink, and they all looked at ever after I stopped drinking. That's going to happen, right? It didn't. Um, so how do you define recovery? Does anybody anybody want to volunteer? What's your definition of recovery? Continue to make steps toward a better life in the future. Continuing to make steps for a better life in the future. Anybody else? Moving towards some great things. <laughs> Moving towards some great things. I love that. Um, now looking back at my clients, looking back at my kids. We are moving towards great things. The progress isn't as fast as I thought. Progress on perfection. But progress on perfection. Yes, absolutely. Anybody else? Life is creating life you want to live. Creating a life you want to live. I've heard Mackenzie say that before, and I love it. So, I took advantage of a captive audience in my groups this last couple of weeks, and I asked some of my clients what their definitions were. 30-year-old um, female, multiple substance use, diagnoses, PTSD, major depressive disorder, general anxiety disorder, and adherence of self-harm and suicidal gestures. She says, I am in multiple recovery of others. I am at different stages of progress with each of my diagnoses. And she didn't say it, but and that's okay. Sometimes I still don't know exactly who I am, and I still have good days and bad days. To me, recovery is being a better version of yourself each day. Not perfect, but better than before. 23-year-old male, opioid meth, and cyclosemia dependence. Anxiety disorder, PTSD. To me, 
I gauge my recovery by my lifestyle. Recovery is a better, healthier lifestyle, avoiding shortcuts and not having to worry about losing my stuff. This is a guy that's been in and out of jail multiple times. Every time that happens, every time he goes to detox, every time he goes to the treatment, something happens. He loses things. 23 year old male, alcohol dependence, cannabis abuse, anxiety, and situational depression. Recovery is losing the past and building on the future. Uh, 38 year old male, generalized anxiety, major depressive disorder, cannabis use. Recovery is a process, it doesn't happen quickly. For me, it is recognizing the small changes, seeing good things happen, and building a life for another family. 34 year old male, schizoaffective. Anxiety disorder, obstructive sleep apnea, and multiple substance use disorders. We'll talk about comorbid. Recovery is being self aware of your symptoms and doing what you can to reduce them. That was not in my definition of recovery until two months ago. <laughs> yes. It is also increasing your ability to manage your world and to live at peace with yourself. Um, 27 year old male, multiple substance use disorders, anxiety, and PTSD. Uh, recovery is reaching the point where I actually want to change and realizing that it is a journey, not a destination. Recovery is also the realization that the way you cope with your problems is all over. Let me keep going. I want to jump to this last. When you come out of the storm, you will never be the same person to walk in. That's what the storm is all about. Yeah. As we talked about navigating, the waters of your diagnosis as we talk about helping our clients to learn to sail the boat. We need to remember that we will come out different for um, This is Jane Clayson Johnson telling your story while being with us this with loving attention by others who care may be the most powerful medicine on earth. I believe in fact ensuring it's vital to let you bring this appeal into open minds. I have witnessed this in others and experienced it for myself. Um, this should guide what we do as peers. Be curious about the things you're not understanding. Be willing to step in and be vulnerable. Be willing to learn more about the things you don't know. Um, remember the officer. And always be refining your definition of recovery. And you'll have success in your life. So, the meetings and the co workers. Alan, thank you. Thank you.